We are at a critical juncture for our city. What does it look like to have social equity through social policy? Retired King County Judge Kathy Moore and social equity consultant Christiana Obi Sumner beat out eight other candidates for a chance to replace Deborah Juarez on the Seattle City Council. Nice to meet you, I'm Christiana. A renter, Obi Sumner says housing is a top priority for District 5, which stretches from Northgate to Lake City and Greenwood to Bitter Lake. My name is Kathy Moore. A recent homeowner, Moore left the bench to advocate for social change in a city undergoing many changes. Will D5 voters favor a longtime judge or a small business owner? It is not humane, nor is it safe to have people living in tents on our streets. The candidates debate. What I do uh, oppose is sweeps. The race to represent North Seattle in District 5, next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. The battle for the Seattle City Council's District 5 seat yielded 10 primary candidates, more than any other district. Former Judge Kathy Moore and social equity consultant Christiana Obi Sumner emerged as the top choices to replace Council President Deborah Juarez, who decided not to run for a third term. The two candidates have very different backgrounds and different stances on issues like public safety, homelessness, and more. This week, our focus is on North Seattle and the race for D5. My name is Kathy Moore. Former Superior Court Judge Hi. Kathy Moore. I'm Christiana. Nice. And Christiana O.B. Sumner, a social equity consultant, are the lead contenders for Seattle City Council District 5, from Northgate to Lake City and Greenwood to Bitter Lake. I'm not a new face to City Hall. Uh, we are at a critical juncture. Moore led a 10-person D5 primary with 31% of the vote and says she has a lot to offer the district after three decades in public service. I would really like an opportunity to take everything that I know and have experienced um, and work upstream and proactively. OB Sumner earned 24% of the primary vote and says in running their own consulting business, they're well aligned with D5's working families. I have to work 40 hours a week in addition to campaigning. There's a need to both have that knowledge of policy and how to do this job and a wisdom of lived experience. That experience for OB Sumner includes a career as a small business owner and burlesque performer, overcoming a life of chronic illness. I'd be the first openly autistic city council member in the country. The former co-chair of the Seattle Disabilities Commission and Renters Commission says housing is their top priority. It speaks to the economic justice issue, the transit levy, even down to the contract with the Seattle Police Department. Everything in a lot of ways has this sort of interconnectedness through housing. Moore has chaired the Seattle Human Rights Commission and has served as Seattle's interim city clerk. So I have directly uh, worked at getting legislation passed. She says public safety is the top priority for her district and the entire city. And while Moore supports 911 alternatives, I want to make sure that we actually get those programs up and running. She's calling for increased police hiring too. So right now we don't have enough police to actually adequately respond to priority one calls. With district District 5 incumbent Deborah Juarez deciding not to run again. It's a longtime public servant up against a social justice advocate with some different ideas on what it means to replace her. I would like to very much continue in her path of being a strong and effective advocate. A natural part of life that is important for progress is change. Well, here we are with the candidates for District 5, Kathy Moore and Christiana Obi Sumner. Thank you both for being here. Let's get started here. We had a coin flip before the show, and Kathy, you'll be speaking first an opening statement of why you're running. One minute, please. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me here today, Brian. My name is Kathy Moore, and I'm running for Seattle City Council for District 5. Um, I'm a lifelong Seattleite, former King County Superior Court judge, former Seattle City Clerk, former public defender. I'm a small business owner. Um, I'm a community volunteer, and I'm the mother of three Seattle Public School graduates. 
Um, I have made public service my life's work. I have spent the last three decades in our community in the front lines um, trying to improve people's lives and broken systems. And I want to bring that lifetime of relevant experience to the job of creating a city that works for all of us. Um, and to that end, my priorities in this race are the priorities of my district, which are public safety, <clears throat> homelessness, and affordability. And I look forward to discussing that further today. And we definitely will do that. Uh, Christiana, if you wouldn't mind, an opening statement, please keep it to a minute. Thank you so much again for having me as well. I am running for Seattle City Council District 5 because I have worked in this city for the last 13 plus years. And I've done that in so many different ways as a case manager, direct social service worker, co-chair of the Seattle Disability Surrenders Commission, and as a, a policy advocacy and social equity consultant. What's really exciting is that I have been asked to run about every two years for the last six since I ran for the transparency seat in 2017. And I am happy to amplify uh, the, the toolkit and the successes I've had. And I know we'll be getting into more details about that. So I just want to give that little teaser. Okay. I want to expand, if I could, on your backgrounds. You've both mentioned them to me. I know uh, in talking in the field and in, in, our, in our setup here, too, you have some different stories to tell. And Kathy, could you expand on that a little bit? A parent, a judge, an interim city clerk, and, and why you think that experience is important to bring to the city council? Sure. Well, I mean, um, a lot of what the city council is dealing with right now is the intersection between the criminal legal system, the behavioral health system, and the social service system. So certainly as a public defender representing families in the child welfare system, representing individuals in the behavioral health system, and individuals in the criminal legal system, and then as a judge, seeing working in all those systems, uh, making decisions that re affected people's lives in those decisions, I have both the uh, professional experience of being an advocate for individuals, but also the professional experience of seeing what the unintended consequences can be of laws, um, but also being in a position of having to uphold the law and make d decisions that affect people's daily lives in very profound ways. Um, as a Seattle City Clerk, uh, my job was to be uh, oversee a staff of 30, uh, a budget of $3 million to make sure that the record of the council was properly maintained, uh, to work with all nine council members, which I did uh, in an effort to get a reclassification uh, ordinance passed, which uh, greatly increased the salaries for everybody who uh, was in that office. Mm -hmm. And then as a parent, I also understand the struggles of trying to raise children in a, a somewhat, not somewhat, a very inexpensive city, a very expensive city, excuse yeah. me, uh, and trying to find appropriate childcare while also working uh, and just struggling to make sort of ends meet day to day. Okay, thank you for that. Christiane, I wanna to talk to you about this as well. You talked to, the, talked to us about this out in the field, your background as a social equity consultant, a housing coordinator, person with multiple, multiple disabilities, a burlesque performer too. Talk to us about your life experiences, how they've shaped you into being possibly a Seattle, Seattle City Council member. Yes, yeah, so I grew up in a family that was very civically engaged, uh, especially if one of those disabilities is being autistic and being born in the early mid 80s. I was not given the uh, benefit of the Americans with Disabilities Act um, going through public school. And so my mom really taught me about disability justice and fighting for policy change and fighting for um, what it truly is equitable at the end of the day before that was even something that I knew about. That carried me when I came here to Seattle. Um, of course, there has been a lifetime as a youth leader um, before I came here uh, to be able to do that work. And through that, as soon as I hit the campus and being able to advocate for changes, uh, amplify the needs of our communities, especially when uh, Seattle U was thinking about banning same-sex marriages in uh, St. Ignatius, Having that go towards the work at DESC, being a member of SEIU 1199 and talking about racialized ableism in the workplace, that leading to our epiphanies of equity, working with over 250 businesses, governments, and organizations across the country, but concentrated here, and being one of those people who are always called back of house, policy strategists, policy theorists, how do you put this in place? How do you make this go? What is actually going to lead to success and effective success? That's what I've been called. And so that all 
the, the, all of that lived experience, both that knowledge and that wisdom comes into it. Christiana, I want to stick with you and let's talk about public safety. So this summer, the Seattle Police Department put out a report that showed the time that it took officers to respond to crimes in the North Precinct, which includes District 5, was longer than any other precinct, the worst in the city. Priority one calls like robberies or shots fired took more than nine minutes to get a response. The SPD aims for seven or less on those calls. What do you make of those numbers? Does Seattle need to hire more officers? Tell us about your plans to improve public safety in District 5. Yeah, I think it's absolutely terrible because I would, I really, if I having for myself a priority one call, I really want a police officer to show up. What I have seen, however, is because there have been these growing issues uh, that we've experienced as well as growing concerns, we've, we've relied on the police a lot. Not only has the community um, sort of been saying this, but the police have been saying this, that they are working out of purview, they're working out of scope, and that there's so much that we're asking them to do. So in a lot of ways, when I talk about Let's see what those, those areas and services are that are at a purview and scope and sort of reallocate that to existing community services, alternative community services, to priority, you know, three, four calls, right? Cover responder perhaps in priority three, uh, uh, priority two, and then police directly in priority one. That's actually out of respect for police. When I read the uh, Police Enforcement found, uh, Research Foundation's reports, they said the number one reason for the issue of recruitment or retention for police, so going all the way back to 2016, was wellness and burnout. So we want to make sure that we have police until we can increase that recruitment. And that's really what I think is going to increase our community safety at the end of the day. Thank you. Kathy, some thoughts about this, maybe about what your opponent is saying. Your approach to public safety might be a little different in terms of uh, hiring officers, et cetera. What do we got? Right. So I'm the only candidate in this race that has consistently said from the beginning that we need to hire more police officers. <clears throat> we need to hire at least 300 to 400 additional officers because we are not in a position where they are able to respond to pride, pride, pride. <laughs> priority one calls mm -hmm. uh, in a timely manner. I would note that my opponent uh, told Real Change that they supported cutting the police budget. Um, they also uh, said that they supported um, that we needed to reassess our over-reliance on police and the police model. Um, they have also supported a position which was with the solidarity budget that was put forth in 2020 with the defund movement. And the purpose of that budget was to reallocate funding out of the police department into what we're seeing now with the care department. While that's certainly a valid approach, the ultimate uh, goal is to completely defund the police budget and have only money for non um, non non-armed responders. The problem with that is that we are always going to need armed response. And the, also the problem is that while it's incredibly important to amply fund this alternative co-responder model, by doing so, we are not going to lessen the police need to be able to respond to priority one calls. They are not overburdened because they are responding to priority three or four, four calls. They are overburdened because they don't have enough staff to respond to the actual violence that is happening in our community. And the only way to resolve that is to increase the police numbers. Yeah, Christiana, please. Yeah, I just want to say, to clarify a couple of things. Number one, we have, we, the city of Seattle in 2019 actually proctored a study that showed that, but depending on who you ask, even Chief Diaz spoke on it, between 40 and 60 percent of the calls at SPD don't actually have to be responded to by SPD. The second thing I think is really important is when I talk about reallocating the resources or really reallocating the purview, it's not for the defund. I will say that if we're just slashing the budget by 50%, but we don't have a plan in place, you know, I guess it's going to give money to the communities, but that's not necessarily going to address this issue of a community safety directly. When I talk about reallocating purview, I would be looking at the average cost of the services that, that in the, uh, when they respond to those services. Mm -hmm. And it would be from that estimate that we would look at the average cost of them responding to those services for priority three, priority four calls that would be reallocated. It wouldn't be a hack slash. And finally, when I talk about having a community responder model or having a reimagining of police, I talk about the city, the, the, the county I grew up in, which is Camden County, New Jersey, which was considered the murder capital of the world. Mm -hmm. 
they did completely overhaul their police department and had a decrease of 70 percent in homicides and crimes to the point that as municipal police, they had more police at the end of the day than they did when they were originally in the police department. So as long as we are working towards the police having wellness, that they're able to focus on the calls that we need them to focus on, and if we have the ability to do something different and transformative, why not? Okay, Kathy, a quick rejoinder if you could. Right, so I think if you look at the Camden police model, you'll see that they, as Christiana has just noted, they actually doubled their police department. They restarted over. They didn't eliminate police. They now have twice as many police officers. Mm -hmm. They are in the community. They're doing, you know, barbecues and outreach to the community, which certainly we should be doing in our community. But they're also heavily reliant on surveillance. They're basically doing soft policing. There are a lot of concerns about enhanced surveillance as a way of policing people. Additionally, I think the record is clear that my opponent stated to real change they supported cutting the police budget, and reallocation is basically a repackaging of the defund philosophy. Here's another issue that I think might draw some, some differences here. I want to talk about the issue of public drug use, uh, drug possession. There was a drawn-out battle over this. As you know, the city council passed a measure this fall allowing the city attorney to prosecute these cases as gross misdemeanors. The mayor says he wants to lead with treatment and diversion. Resources, of course, there are limited as always. Kathy, I just wanted to ask you this. Did the city get this right? Um, I hope so. I mean, I think that ultimately that was the intent of this legislation was to make sure that we have an additional tool and our tool belt to deal with the incredible um, fentanyl epidemic and methamphetamine epidemic that we're seeing on our streets. So the one thing that I think is important about this bill is that at every juncture, the instruction is to look, is to pursue diversion into treatment. Um, and so that is incredibly important that the council make sure that there is sufficient funding to create a treatment infrastructure. And one of my criticisms of the current council <clears throat> is that they had two years uh, or longer to actually create such treatment infrastructure, and they did not do so. They did not go down to Olympia and advocate for an additional part of the pie, which they could have done. So, and I want to point out that in a recent uh, study that, came, uh, that just came out recently, mm -hmm. you know, 81% of people surveyed believed that the council's hands-off approach to the to the uh, public drug use has actually been contributing to the uh, exponential explosion in street crime and just basic public misery. Um, and so it is something that we need to deal with. Uh, it's also important to keep a close eye on what the, um, <clears throat> the racial uh, uh, enforcement uh, stats are. And I was really pleased to see that there are very robust reporting, uh, data collection and reporting requirements in the bill that was passed. It's important that we keep the city attorney coming and talking to the council about that. Thank you. Christiane, I think you might have a different tick, uh, tack on this when it comes to public drug use. Can you break that down for us, please? Yeah, I think what's really important is, you know, we talked before this that my background is in social uh, psychology and community mental health, right? Mm -hmm. Although I didn't take the, the sitting exam, I took all the classes. Got it. Um, and so what's really important to me, right, is that if we truly want the community safety element, we want to make sure that we're not just sort of seeing public drug use, but we're actually putting in solutions that are going to help folks get treatment. We have to, we have to use what works. And so with this current public drug use bill, what I saw was a letter that was signed by dozens of psychiatrists, therapists, social workers that was like, this is not the way, but there is a way. Mm -hmm. And there are international models of overdose prevention centers. There are, you know, making sure also that we have staff to actually run these programs. Yeah, that, you don't you know, support the arresting model, it sounds like, when it comes to public drug use. We know that carceral beds cost at least twice as much as anything else. And we also know that the King County Jail has one of the, the nation's highest suicide rates. And we know that the jail model, it's... It's hit or miss. This is, you know, we've already went to the war on drugs. I, I remember as a case manager taking my clients to ITA core, you know, mental health core, and mm -hmm. in some cases that worked. But if there was more of a um, human-centered, peer-led, and empirically proven model that's actually going to get folks in the door, that's what's really 
uh, I, I will be going for. Got it. Kathy, quickly, a rejoinder you had? Yeah, so my rejoinder is that as a King County Superior Court judge, I often had people come before me who had committed crimes because of an underlying addiction. Um, we were given an opportunity to sentence people to alternative treatments, and those alternative treatments were drug treatment. So it was a mandatory participation through the carceral system in drug treatment. Those, um, those programs were, in fact, very effective. I have had people come back to me and say, but for being uh, put through the criminal justice system and being mandated to do treatment, I would be dead. So I think we have to stop this narrative that, uh, that there's only one way to deal with this. Anybody whose life has been affected by drug use knows that intervention is required, and there are various approaches to intervention. And the last thing that I will say is that my opponent supports uh, supervised consumption sites as the alternative to putting people into treatment. I want to make sure that you get a chance to respond to that, please. Yes, you know, one of the things that's really important here is that if we are talking about someone who, say, is arrested because they committed a crime, a burglary, something like that, that's getting, you know, that's different than someone who is outside and they're using, and then you, we make it a misdemeanor, and then they are arrested for drug use without any sort of crime of impact of other folks. That overdose prevention site is international, internationally and empirically proven uh, direction. But the thing is, it's not about just that. There's nothing about my platform or my, um, my policy proposals that's you have to be this or you have to be that. It's about what the multiple pathways towards shared goals look like. And so if there is someone who, say, has been caught, you know, in a robbery who's for you know, also using drugs, and through that system, we also have a pathway that's actually going to lead to effective progress, does not continue to traumatize, actually uh, doesn't have high levels of recidivism, great. But until then, we need to make sure that we have alternative pathways for folks who need help right now, and that overdose prevention center provides a space for folks to go so they aren't outside using the drugs. Briefly, if you could. Right. So uh, that is the model that Portugal has used. Portugal has recently uh, really backtracked on that because it has been ineffective. And it is not... Uh, the problem with the supervised consumption sites is that people continue to use... This is documented. They continue to use rather than getting into treatment. The goal is to get people into treatment and recovered. I would love to try to move on to another topic if I could here with you. And, Christiana, I'll start with you. Your platform talks about helping people who are homeless in the short term and long term, especially reaching out to the most vulnerable. So, short term, I talked with Council President Juarez not too long about this. She's not running again for a D5 seat. She put out a study this summer that showed D5 only has about 8% of the city's total tiny house village units. There is a plan to add a village in Maple Leaf by the end of this year in D5. I guess I wanted to ask it this way. Does D5 need more tiny house villages? Maybe tell us about that and other plans you have to deal with homelessness if you're elected. Yes, I was really excited to go to an event um, at Nicholsville where they were showing the eco um, an eco village model and it was so cool to see that they had solar panels that was uh, really, you know, they had rainwater collection, they had gardens, and it was a beautiful moment to be able to, to really speak to that group. And for them to say in that meeting that, uh, that the, um, the Nicholsville was a preferred sort of alternative to being outside on, on the street. I don't know if you ever spend time in a shelter, whether it's volunteering, working, or otherwise. There's a reason why folks don't want to go to the shelter, and it's not because they don't want housing, it's because they also want to be safe. And especially since the staff is overworked and overburdened, we need to make sure that we have those alternative solutions. We need, we, we have seen an increase not only in unhoused folks in District 5, but also a diversity of people in District 5, um, more permanent supportive housing, which is great. Being able to have multiple types of housing for multiple stages of life and being able to have growth opportunities, that's what I believe can be healing and transformative so that we can have a neighborhood where we're all uh, interconnected in a community. Thank you. Some thoughts about homelessness, Kathy, maybe about what Christiana's saying or your plans as well, tiny house villages, other options for dealing with this crisis. So, absolutely. So I think we have to start from the this point that we say it is not humane, nor is it safe to have people living in tents on our streets. So my opponent's position is that people should be allowed to live in tents on the street until affordable permanent housing becomes available to, 
available to them. I do not support that. I support moving people from tents into shelter. There are many ways that we need to improve our shelter capacity. We need to improve the barriers uh, that keep people from wanting to utilize shelter, such as not being able to bring pets or be with their partners. Um, we need to make shelter ac access available 24-7. Right now, you can't get into shelter on a Saturday or Sunday. You need a social service referral. People ought to be able to show up on their own to the shelter. So there are many ways that we can improve that. Um, I would say that I would look at um, <clears throat> the Auburn uh, director of anti-homelessness approach who said, for homelessness per se, we need to be more proactive, we need to consolidate our outreach, expand our shelter options, stop the pipeline, and provide essential services to people in the shelters themselves. Thank you. I'd like to give you about 30 plus seconds to respond to that, please. Sure. I just want to clarify, I don't think anyone needs to be outside at all. I formerly unhoused, and I, that has been everything from literally in the middle of a doorway to a car to a shelter. That's completely inhumane. What I do uh, oppose is sweeps, especially winter sweeps, because it's <clears throat> just sort of moving folks from street to street. But I really take to heart what was said at Nicholsville, that if we were to have more of those sort of uh, spaces, and if that is the alternative, the preferred alternative for folks who are currently outside on tents, then that's what we should do until that housing or that shelter becomes evolved. Yes, we need more shelter beds. Yes, we need more housing. Yes, we need to make sure that the social housing PDA is fully funded for folks who are not able to go through the other pipelines, but no one it should be outside. We need to start wrapping Good. up here. And Kathy, I'm sorry, we are out of time. <laughs> right. I wanted to make sure I talked about this. Your campaign's raised about $92,000 as of mid-October. Tell us about your top three endorsements, what you think voters should draw from that. I can give you about 45 seconds. Okay. Um, my top endorsements are Mayor Harrell, um, MLK Labor, and also uh, personally uh, important to me as well is uh, every, ta every Town for Gun Safety. Um, I think that those endorsements uh, demonstrate that I have a broad base of support um, from, um, you know, established, respected elected leadership to organized labor to gun safety advocates who recognize that I am going to be thoughtful, um, uh, evidence-based, and um, utilize an approach of good governance that's going to make the city work for everyone. Thank you very much. Christiana, your campaign's raised about $104,000 as of mid-October here. Your top three endorsements, a final call to voters, 45 seconds, please. Yes, I have the sole endorsement of both the 36th, the 46th legislative Democrats, as well as King County Democrats. I've been endorsed by Noel Frame, Rebecca Saldana, Chapala Street, Gurmais Alahai, and also have the endorsement of the, the bus uh, drivers and operators, uh, ATU, as well as UAW, in solidarity with their fight right now. The thing that's really important about my fundraising numbers is that Everything except for $3,000 has came from community. We have had, we have nearly doubled the individual donors that um, we've, anyone has had. And, you know, it's, it's really because of the Democracy Voucher Program I've been able to do this. So my call to voters is, I, I want to say just really quickly that I think it's really important for our new city council to be folks who are focused on the goals of how we move forward. And throughout this interview or this debate, I think what's really important is that, you know, there's different sort of approaches. But if you, if you see, my focus is not about what Kathy does or does not believe or does or does not do. My focus is on the policy and how we help people. And so okay. that's who I would be if elected. Fair enough. Thank you both for your input here. And we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about the two candidates for Seattle City Council District 5? One person writes, everyone, support Christiana, a smart, hardworking, strong, well-qualified, viable candidate that reflects the experiences of our district. Another person comments, Kathy Moore is definitely our best bet. She's smart, thoughtful, and on the right side regarding public safety, homelessness, and housing. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on social media. Coming up next week, first-term council member Dan Strauss faces challenger Pete Hanning, executive director of the Fremont Chamber, in the race to represent Ballard, Green Lake, Fremont, and West Magnolia on the Seattle City Council. The District 6 debate on the next City Inside Out. I hope you join us. <laughs>